Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Select Convo for the Helm School of Government. I'm Ron Miller, the Interim Dean, and if you would, let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to assemble here this morning. We thank you for the privilege of being able to have conversations without reprisal, Lord. We pray that we never take that for granted. And Lord, we pray that the words we speak today would be pleasing to your ears, and that in all things, Lord, we would remember that you seek for us to be one as you and the Father are one. We thank you and we praise you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So our topic this morning is E Pluribus Unum, which is out of many, one, and we are discussing how to achieve national unity in a time of great divisiveness in our country. And we have with us some great guests that are going to share their experiences and thoughts with you. First, I would like to introduce Mr. Clarence Henderson. He is a civil rights icon. He, in 1960, did a sit-in at the Woolworths counter in Greensboro, North Carolina. And so he was at the vanguard of people who were trying to achieve liberty for all of us. He's now the president of the Frederick Douglass Foundation of North Carolina, and he continues to fight for liberty, justice, and conservative values. Then we have First Lieutenant Jeremy Hunt, United States Army. Uh, he is the uh, lead strategist for the Douglass Leadership Institute. And he has been a prominent spokesperson with Fox News and has written articles for the Washington Post and The Hill Magazine. And so we welcome these gentlemen with us. And all the way to my right is Mr. Mark Akers, the Director of Projects and Initiatives for the Helm School of Government. And so please give all of these gentlemen a warm welcome. We're going to give each of them an opportunity to uh, speak, and then we're going to have a series of questions, a kind of a living room conversation, if you will. So we hope that you will find that fascinating in terms of the discussion we have. So I'd like to start by inviting Mr. Henderson to share a few thoughts with us. I'd like to say <clears throat> good morning, everybody. It is indeed a delight to be here with you today to share with you where we go from here as far as America's concerned. Hopefully I can say something to you that will pass the torch of liberty to you to understand this great country that we live in and the fact that freedom is not free. It's a price that must be paid. It must be paid in full. It must be paid up front. I am very privileged to have participated in one of the greatest movements that happened in America. It was not a choice, by choice, uh, I was invited, and one of the things uh, I've always done is that I've had enough courage to uh, participate in things that I believed in. On February 1st, 1960, a shot was fired that was heard around the world when four students walked into F.W. Woolworths in downtown Greensboro and sat down at the lunch counter and asked to be served. Now, that wasn't anything unusual, or it should not have been, except that those four men, uh, freshman students, were black, and they sat down with an unwritten code of law known as Jim Crow, forbade them to do so. So the question becomes, why did these uh, four Moses part the Red Sea of oppression? Why did these four Hebrews go into the fiery furnace, and why did uh, uh, we sit down and, and do what we did. It was because of the fact that I came out of an era known as Jim Crow, where there was a law that said we were separate but equal. For me, it was one step above slavery, but I happened to be born in a household that taught me that I was just as good as anybody else. And so I had, uh, when I was growing up, I used to go in the Woolworths downtown and uh, go downstairs in the basement, and they had two bathrooms, one saying colored and one saying white, and had two water fountains. And uh, I won wondered what the difference of the water was because they were both looked just alike, and I wondered uh, what the difference was. When you went upstairs, everything was the same except when we went to, went to the, the lunch counter to eat. We had to order our food uh, from the back of the lunch counter, pay the same price, but we could not sit down and eat. 
And so we decided that based on strategy, we would pick, we would pick Woolworths because it was a chain store, hoping that it would spread all across the southern part of the United States. It even went so far as New York, even though um, the calendar there was integrated. And so on February 2nd, it's when I came in because I was not aware that um, they had done what they had done on the first day. One of the things I want to share with you is, is not where you come from, it's where you're going. Because I was born on what was called, known as the wrong side of the tracks. Um, I'm the f I'm first and only person out of my immediate family to graduate from college. My mother and father only had a third grade uh, education. But one of the things that was key is that they were a family unit. And uh, my father worked six days a week. Uh, my mother never worked anything but a part-time job. And my father went to church every Sunday. I could hear him praying over his family every night, just like uh, as if it was yesterday. And so I had this great opportunity to participate in this movement that was a movement, a principle-driven movement. Across America, you have what I call, our history tells us that we have had two types of movements. One being an agenda-driven movement which oppresses people, or a principle-driven movement which helps us move toward freedom. The agenda-driven movement moves us back toward the oppression of King George III. So we live in this country where we have a great opportunity to uh, show our own destiny. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I'm like Jonah because uh, I decided I was going to leave the South, never come back again, and went to New York. And I grew up in an era time um, where the, the military draft was still going on. So I got drafted out of New York. I was sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, from Fort Jackson, South Carolina to, to Fort Gordon, Georgia, from Fort Gordon, Georgia to Fort Rook, Alabama, where I spent 16 months when George Wise was a governor. I was as close to Vietnam as I could possibly be without having been able to carry a weapon. So when I left, uh, got out of the military, they gave me just enough money to get back to Greensboro, North Carolina. So you remember I said I participated in the sit-in movement. When I was in New York, the riots broke out there. One of the riots broke out there. When I went back on NT's campus, um, the riots broke out there. So I always tell people, you have to be careful when I'm around because something may break out there. <laughs> so don't be surprised if something happens here. <laughs> but um, I came back to, to uh, North Carolina, uh, and then I left again, and I wound up going back to North Carolina. I spent almost 30 years being in business myself. America offers a great opportunity because it's not where you come from, it's where you're going. Uh, not only am I, the, am I the president of the Frederick Douglass Foundation of the state of North Carolina, I was elected uh, some six years ago to become the chairman for the Martin Luther King Commission by Governor McCrory, sight unseen. And so the reason why I participate in uh, the, um, uh, pre being the president of the Frederick Douglass Foundation is because there needs to be more unity in this country. We are better apart, are better together than we are apart. The, the, the uh, segregation and racism and all these, these things are being created now. It's not like it was when I was growing up, where I never went to an integrated school, never sat at the lunch counter, was bused all of my uh, 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 school life. But what happened with busing, you take advantage of every opportunity you have, is that I saw some things outside of the community that I would not have seen. Now, when you sit down at that lunch counter, uh, the KKK came in. We, uh, there was a bomb threat. Some of us went to jail. There were all kinds of things that happened, called all kind of names, but we sat there, and the movement was based on nonviolence, because violence be begets violence. And so we had this great opportunity to expose to America some of the wrong things that America was doing, and we put Jim Crow on trial, and Jim Crow was found guilty of racism. 
And so we have to be aware right now, any of you that you ever decide to participate in a movement, because the Constitution says we can, it has to be orderly, but make sure you understand the movement that you're participating in and make sure that it's a cause that you believe in. I have had the opportunity to march uh, in a, an event um, down in Birmingham, Alabama, where there were some 20,000 people marching for All Lives Matter and not just Black Lives Matter. And so we are, we are being used by people that want to still talk about the color, color of one's skin, but we have to realize all this is is dirt and it doesn't matter whether it's black dirt or white dirt. So we need to have this unity now. When I was born, a very unusual thing happened to me when I was born. I don't sit here by accident. My father was a sharecropper and he named me after his best friend who was white, so it helped me uh, set the tone for me to bridge the gap between the races. So you see, I believe in divine intervention, and this thing has followed me from then, uh, then up to now, and I'm, I go across America right now speaking about unity. I've had the opportunity to do invocation for our president on five different occasions. Uh, our, uh, Mike Pence on three or four different occasions. I will believe even uh, on next Thursday going to do the invocation for Black History Month at the, uh, 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 at the White House. It'll be my second time there. So here's this little unassuming kid that had the opportunity, God called me out uh, for me to do certain things. If you have not talked to God about what your purpose is here on this earth, you need to do so so that you make sure you go in the right direction because none of us are here by accident. And so I want to leave you with the fact that we are better together than we are apart. As Dr. King said, unless we learn to live together as brothers, we will perish together as fools. And we should be judged not by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. And so long as we do that, America will continue to be great again. The thing I would leave with you at this point is that you should think about America according to the second sentence in the, uh, the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they have been endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. No man, no woman, no person, no entity has a right to take those rights away from you. Those rights are unalienable. But too often, we're now we're depending on the government instead, instead of we the people, because if you look at our Constitution, it starts off the preamble says, we the people, not we the government, not they the government. So we are allowing 535 people to tell us what we as Americans should do. So there needs to be a me unity in America so that we can make America great again like it once was. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. And I'd like to have Mr. Hunt with, make his remarks. Oh, great. I get to go after this. This is, this is fun. I mean, you spend like five minutes with the guy, and you're like, what have I done with my life? Like, I, like I, I went to college. I don't know. He was integrating lunch counters when he was my age. Uh, so it's tough coming after him. Uh, but it's definitely an honor being here and being amidst a legend right here. Um, and I just I honor you on behalf of our generation. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made. Uh, and that, that means so much. I'm so happy and privileged that I could grow up uh, around people that didn't look like me and we could celebrate those differences. Uh, if it wasn't for the sacrifice that you and, and your peers made, we wouldn't have gotten to do that. So I thank you. Um, and so, I, first off, I'm happy to be back. This is my second time here, so that's my big claim to fame, is that this is actually, I got invited back again to the Liberty. So I, I got to speak this time last year uh, to several of the uh, School of Government classes. Um, so I'm sure there are some familiar faces in the audience. I can't really see you, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure you're there. Um, so. Uh, first and foremost, I, I just got in from Arizona, and I'm, I'm running off of like four hours of sleep. So if my remarks don't make sense, just let me know, and I'll clarify later. Uh, but first off, I, I wanted to say that uh, I'm happy that you're here, um, because this moment in our country, uh, we are coming into such a time of such division. If you look at 
Uh, the American Psychological Association, Association did a poll, and they found that over 60% of Americans say that this is one of the worst times of American history that they've ever lived in. Um, even more, actually, if you look at from 1972 to 2012, um, the numbers of people that say they can even trust their fellow Americans uh, has plummeted. Uh, now, only about 30% of Americans say they even trust their fellow citizens. Um, so we're in a time of extreme division, uh, people that, that don't look like us, we don't want to associate as much, people that don't think like us, we really don't want to associate with, uh, and they're in constant, we are pitted against each other, uh, and we're all living uh, in the same country. And then you have different politicians and political pundits uh, on the news giving their takes. And what's interesting is that you hear a lot of these folks talking about, they'll actually use the term racial reconciliation, we need healing uh, in this country. Uh, and you hear that, uh, and then but what's so interesting is that you notice nothing ever changes. Uh, and, and they'll say that in the beginning of their speech, and by the end of their speech, they're talking about the other, you know, the others, the other 50% of Americans that are, you know, leading our country into ruin. And uh, after they get done playing all this lip service to healing and racial reconciliation, all this stuff. Uh, but what you're seeing is a lot of them are taking uh, what really is the church's mission. Uh, they take that, racial reconciliation and healing, they try to strip God out of it and then wonder why it doesn't work, right? And so we're getting, so we're, thank you. I got one, I think I appreciate that. Uh, and so, uh, so we're living during, during a time that now, this is the church's responsibility. And, and then we look, uh, unfortunately, we look at the church, and, and no one expects to follow the church uh, in the country. We, we aren't taking the lead on the issues. And a lot of times we're, we don't really know how to talk about some of these difficult subjects. Sometimes we're like, well, we don't really know, you know, how, how do we address this? Um, and, and, and ultimately, it's hard for the church to lead the way with unity when our own churches are so divided. And I actually don't mean just racially. I mean, even just with denominations and everything, people that worship differently than us, we look down on them. Like, oh, he raises his hands, well, she does, and oh, okay, he sit down. I mean, it's like we think that we're all just like these different classes of Christians. Uh, so my question is, how can we unite the country around a flag if we can't even unite around the cross? The, our country right now, we have to be at a place of prayer and unity. Well, one thing, uh, I went to a military academy, uh, and at West Point, we, everyone wears the same exact uniform, uh, the same exact, we're all trained in the exact same profession, uh, we all take very similar courses, um, everything is very uniform, uh, but yet, you know, one of the most difficult things to do at the academy was actually to get all the Christians together for one night. It was just incredible. We, we, we decided, a group of us was like, how about we have just one night of unity and we bring together all the different Christian groups on campus. And you would have thought we were trying to do something just completely impossible. It's like, oh wow, you're, you're actually gonna try to get everyone like together, uh, but we don't do that here. Like, and so uh, it wasn't until we actually started what we called the, the cadet prayer room. And it's literally a room that we dedicated to prayer, 24 hours prayer, it's still going to this day. Uh, and, we, and we came together and we said, okay, let's, let's pray together and see what happens. And after that, we were actually able to get this incredible night of unity, uh, and it's something that I believe still goes on at the academy. Um, and, and, but it was so powerful is when Christians came together, united around the same cause, believing in, in, the, same, in the same voice, believing in the same cross. Uh, and that's what we need in our country, because I'm telling you, there are no political solutions to the human condition. The, the issue of racism and division in our country, it is a sin problem, and the only antidote to sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we have the answers in our church. We, we have the hope that we, that we have found in Christ. Why are we so quiet to share this with the rest of the world that clearly does not know how to foster a spirit of unity and be in, in this, on one accord? And so, so, what, so what do we do about this? So uh, there are a few, I, I want to leave you, leave you with some practical steps. Um, but, but even before then, I will say, even when we look at what, what we see on the news and what we see going on in our country, uh, this should break our hearts. This should, this should mourn our hearts that where we are at as a country. Uh, and the biggest problem that I see from the church is just a spirit of apathy. It's just like, I mean, man, I just guess it's the way things are, man. This is kind of, it's unfortunate. Uh, I mean, you know, we'll keep, we'll keep praying and, and I, I don't know. I mean, it's like we, we just don't really care. 
And, and, and I think that is so antithetical to the gospel because when we read, even in the gospels, we read Jesus was moved by compassion and he healed the masses. So we have to have a spirit of compassion birthed in you so that you want to make a change in our country. You have to shake yourself out of apathy. And I'm telling you, in college, it's so easy because we have so many other responsibilities and we're just trying to get through and, get, and make good grades and, get, and graduate. But I'm telling you, there is a whole generation waiting for the answers that we have. And so, um, so a, a few practical things I will leave you with. Uh, first and foremost, and, and I, I said this the last time I was here, and that is uh, when we look at our own identity, we have to first know that our identity is rooted in Christ. Our, our love for Christ comes before every other identity, before I am a black, before I'm a man, before I am anything else, I am a man of God. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian that, that loves the Lord. So that, that has to be rooted in our identity so that no other movement, no other political cause, no other agenda will ever sweep us away from what we know. So that's first and foremost, Christians have to know, have to be rooted in our identity in Christ, that that is our most important uh, part of our lives. And then secondly, we have to know that, look, politics, it, it, is, it is such a, a limited activity. It is, it is something that changes constantly, that's always in flux, uh, and, and we act like politics is just the end-all, be-all, it just consumes our world so many times. Uh, but the thing about it is, we have to keep it in its rightful place. The most important areas are family and community and what you do with, with uh, with those around you. That's the most important part. Uh, and, and what's funny is that even if we look at some of our online behavior, I'm not saying anybody in this room, you know, but there are some of those that, you know, claim to be a Christian online. You put it on your profile, a follower of Christ, disciple of the Lord. And then like, you're some of the worst people when you get on all these online debates. It's like, it's like embarrassing. Like, please just like, just stop. I mean, it's, so it's incredible that we, we try to claim that we're, you know, we're Christians, but then we're the first ones to get so angry and heated and say the most offensive stuff online. I'm telling you, I much rather much rather lose a debate than lose my witness, because that's the most important thing I have. So a lot of times we as Christians have to just let it just roll off our backs, especially when you start undertaking something like racial reconciliation. Uh, you, I mean, it's incredible the names you'll be called. I've been called everything in the book. I mean, I could, I could go down the list of things I've been, people, people get creative in their insults these days. It's, it's quite entertaining. I mean, and, they, and then they sit like in your, like, in your DMs, like as you know, so no one can see, it's just between you and them, and they're gonna tell you what they wanna say. I mean, yeah, so I mean, that's the kind of stuff I deal with. Uh, but you got to be above it and just let it and just rise above it and say that, look, my identity, I, I'm, I'm a man of God. I come from a, a, a different kingdom. I'm an ambassador for Christ. And so the different things that we, that we hear, uh, we don't participate in it and we don't let it affect uh, how we do our business. And then thirdly, and this is, I think, one of the more important things we have to remember is that we have to be loyal to truth and, and righteousness. Um, so many times we are so much more loyal to our political parties. We're so much loyal to our, so much more loyal to our agendas, uh, so much uh, more loyal to our, our narratives that we just believe so, so, so much. Um, and that when we are wrong or someone on, on our side is wrong, we don't want to call it out. Or, 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 so we're so quick to call the other side out, but when our side does something, it's like, well, they did it. I mean, it's like, it's like, it's like this whole thing now is like, well, well, you know, they, they did it, so, you know, it's okay because the other side. It's like, we, be loyal to truth. Be loyal to what's right. It doesn't matter if, 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 if it's embarrassing to, to your team or whatever. It, it, that's not what's going to help our country. What helps our country is being devoted to truth. Uh, one of the, the worst things that I've, I've been hearing is like taking like, it's now a very popular thing is like this whole idea of my truth. It's like I hear this all the time, like these, these celebrities are doing these interviews, like, you know, I'm just living my truth. Like, what does that even mean? They don't even know what it means. Like, I mean, it, and, and there is no my truth. There's the truth. And that is the only truth that we are loyal to. And so please don't use that, that phrase, my truth. I, I can't stand it. Uh, but the, so, so we have to get to a place we are loyal to truth and righteousness and not to our, to our own um, political parties or anything else like that. And then lastly, we, we can't be afraid to mobilize. There are times where we as Christians, even we have to go out and march and stand for righteousness. Uh, and, and if we're arrested, oh well. You know, you, you, we have to stand for what's right. Uh, and so I think you've set such a great example uh, that sometimes we do go out and we, when we mobilize. I mean, we have 
Uh, we have an event coming up on February 23rd. The Douglas Leadership Institute is, a, is an institute I'm a part of, named after Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist. Um, and February 23rd, we're going to be marching on, on the mansion here at, at your state capitol. Some of your, uh, your elected, I'm not from Virginia, so I'm not going to claim it. Uh, some of your elected leaders have had some uh, this complete disregard for human life uh, and some of the things that we've seen in the state. So we're going to stand up for righteousness. Uh, that's something that, that we do. Sometimes you mobilize. Uh, Frederick Douglass, who our organization is named after, he believed completely uh, in, in the cause of Christ. He believed that the blood of Jesus was the only answer. And he also believed that while he was alive, he devoted his life to mobilizing and, 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 act, and being an activist uh, for justice. And so if you're sitting in this room, I, I don't believe you're here by chance. Um, I'm happy that it's, it's not compulsory because you're, you're here and you chose to be here. And I'm, I'm thankful um, that you guys made that decision to come uh, because I believe that, that what you're hearing today, I'm hoping that it stirs something in you uh, and, it, and it makes you, uh, it, it makes you want to go out and actually make a change. So I'm thankful for you guys and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very inspiring. And uh, man, I wish I had your energy. <laughs> um, we want to ask both of you a couple of questions that we hope will stir up some thoughts. And, and hopefully, uh, we've talked to some of the students and they've helped us with these questions as well. So as we talk about unity, I'm going to let uh, Mark uh, start the questioning and see where we go from here. You know, it's great to have both of you with us. And we had a wonderful conversation yesterday. And Maybe these, kind of, uh, these questions can just allow us to drill down a little bit and, and uh, invoke change uh, and choice in our student body here today and, and those that are, are, are watching. Um, and one, one item is really to, to see that, um, that the future of this nation and the tone that we're seeing is in our hands. And we can choose to change that tone. The first question is, consistent acts of compassion and tolerance will bring social change but our nation has become more and more polarized. We find that common ground is, is not to be found. In this current climate, can you advise our students how best to practically be involved in advancing social harmony? Um, my question is, where is the church in these times? The church is not the four walls you didn't see Jesus staying inside of the church. We have far too many church uh, people that uh, stay within those four walls and do not come out and be what they were made to be, and that is a change maker. We were created in the image of God. We were created to express God, and in doing that, we're supposed to talk about righteousness, justice, salvation, we are the strongest unit in all the world, but yet we don't recognize who we are. We don't, re we don't recognize the unity that we should have. We should be out uh, taking on the world for what the world is doing at this particular point in time. When uh, the abortion law was passed, where was the church? When same-sex marriage was passed, where was the church? Everybody else is coming out of the closet except Christians. We find ourselves to be like uh, the um, people that, that were with Jesus, his disciples. They wanted to hide in places, but you have to remember that God scattered them because when we look uh, from Genesis to Revelations, we will see the movement of God all through there. He gives us the opportunity to uh, make America what it should be because it was founded on the foundation of, of, of the Bible. And so you guys have an opportunity to go to the mansion of the governor that has made condemning statements. One, the black face. There's no excuse for that. He's not, he, didn't just, he didn't just come out of a vacuum. Infanticide, and we still sit here. He should resign because he does not deserve to hold public office based upon the things that he has done. There's a credibility 
There's a moral turpitude that we're not living up to. But silence means consent. And we as a church are far too silent. I speak out all the time because I see how great America was and how great it is. And it's just a matter of us as Christians to be willing to go out and put our life on the line. It's like the movie Braveheart. Every man dies, but not every man lives. And so before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. But we are a corporate organism of Jesus Christ. We are his body and we're supposed to lay our lives on the line just like he did. And so when we get back to that, all things will work together for the good of men that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither black nor white. There's neither slave nor free man. And so once, once we recognize that, we can work more together, better together as one unit. Awesome. Awesome. I would say um, a couple things. One, um, I think, especially as in college right now, is to read, uh, read literature that, uh, of authors that don't think like you. Um, kind of expose yourself to, and obviously you're already getting a lot of this in college now, but I think reading and, and learning more just about uh, some of these issues is key uh, so that we are informed, uh, so that we're able to, to make uh, solid decisions and, and, and that we're on, that we understand kind of what the major, major issues are uh, at play. Uh, and then secondly, I would also say is uh, get some friends that just don't think like you. Um, I love hanging out with my buddies that are just completely on the opposite end of the, of the spectrum for me. Um, it's, well, for starters, it makes for more interesting conversation. Uh, and, and, it, and it also makes me think, and it makes me, it makes me honestly stronger uh, in my beliefs when I'm around people that don't think like me, because now I'm, I'm constantly um, uh, reassessing and thinking, like, you know, certain things that I might have taken for granted. Uh, so I think that's, a, that's an important thing as well, is just constantly stretch yourself. Don't get comfortable only wanting to, um, to, to be around those that, that have the exact same uh, thought process as you. Uh, I think that's, those are all important uh, keys to remember. Thank you. Thank you. You've already hinted at the fact that the church has not stood up to its responsibilities. Um, out here in this audience, you have the people who are going to be the leaders and influencers in their congregations, in their ministries throughout the nation and sometimes around the world. What would you tell them that they should do when they go into their congregations and into these ministries? What should they do to energize their churches and to motivate them to be salt and light in the world? Uh, if you are going to head a church or uh, even just be a member. We need to understand what the Word of God says. We need to understand that God is a God of order. And the order goes like this. Before there were politics, there was man. And before man, there was God. If we don't serve God, we know what the reality would be. If we don't serve if, if politics don't serve us, then we know what we need to do. Some of you will go into the era of, uh, of, of politics. You need to understand that uh, our, our three, uh, our Charles of Freedom, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, talks about who God is and how we should act. I would love to go to Congress and give them a, ch a ch test on that job description, which is the Constitution that most of them would fail. If any of you are going to go into the area of politics, make sure that you know what the Constitution says, what your rights are according to what God has said that we, who we are. Most of us don't know what we look like when we look at ourselves in the mirror because God looks from inside out and we look from outside in. And we need to reckon ourselves to the fact that this country has not only survived but thrived because of us living out our motto and God we trust and also living according to what the Word of God says because earlier in uh, uh, America's history, there was not any law put forth except they found it in the Bible. So we had to look at God says versus man said and God always wins. That's good. Uh, I think, well, first and foremost, whenever we're talking about church involvement, church activity, everything should be submitted to, to your pastor and into, into uh, to your leadership. Um, but in that as well, I think another important thing uh, is to remember that 
the, the church is 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 the bedrock of a community. I mean, when you when you look at even the, the civil rights movement of, of the past, it was the church that was so crucial to it. I mean, a lot of the meetings were held in churches, um, and so. But now it, it seems like a lot of churches are just kind of straight away from not wanting to get too involved. Um, so I, I think the, m the number one thing, too, is in your own individual communities, make sure that, we're, that you're active um, and the church is reaching out to the community and, and is making itself a place that it's undeniable that, hey, like this church, we need this church in our community. I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to agree with everything they believe, but hey, like they are making an impact. And so when you get to that place that they see the love of Christ in us, uh, even if they, even if they try to deny what we believe or they don't, or they don't align uh, with, with our values, they can't deny that we're having an impact in our community and they can't deny that we care. And so that's the kind of what I was going back to with, with the compassion. Like we have to have a, such a spirit of compassion that we want to, to, to share the love of the Christ with, with the rest of the world. Uh, and it's just so easy for us to get so caught up in our own minds and our own ideas. We come to church and we just want, you know, just for us, you know, I just want to receive and just get, you know, for my spirits to be uplifted and and we walk out and we're not changed and we don't want to change others. Uh, but I don't, I don't believe that, that God is apathetic about the state our country is in right now. And so if you find yourself in a, in a place of apathy, you need to pursue the heart of God and pray and say, God, what do you want? What, what is it that I should be doing? What am I called to do in this season of my life? Because I'm telling you right now, you are just as much in the will of God today, sitting in these seats in college, than you will be 30, 40 years from now. There, there's no like, oh, in 30, 40 years, I'll magically start doing what God has called me to do, or I'll magically arrive and I'll be accomplishing my, the God's destiny for my life. This is God's destiny for your life right now in this season. So pursue his heart now, uh, because it, I tell you right now, tomorrow is not even promised. And so that's important. So when you go to churches, that, that's, I think that's something that's important to, uh, to carry back with you. Thanks. You know, history gives us context. And if we learn our history and learn where the nation, our nation has come from, we understand our, our, our constitution and, and the fight for freedom and what we've been established for and, and the vision that God has placed in, the, in, in this nation. But learning that history is very important so we can judge uh, where we're at today, but also know where we're going. In 1958, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, employed a quote, and he said, the arc of, moral, of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And it gives a true understanding that if you look at the history of the United States, whether it be the Civil War leading to the uh, abolition of slavery, to the Civil Rights Movement leading to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that this nation's history truly has had challenges and pain and success uh, in, that, in progress. And so if we understand our history, we understand exactly uh, where we are today, where we've come from, where we're headed. Um, now, in those previous events, our nation knew exactly what the struggle was, knew uh, what the, the battle was, and also understood what victory was. In the Civil War, and being won, we knew slavery would be, would be abolished. In the struggles of, of the 1960s, we knew that those laws had to be changed. Uh, could you, in your words, express what is today's struggle, and what will victory look like? Well, uh, today's struggle is the same as it was back then. Um, you know, you and I talked about earlier about spiritual warfare. There's more of that going on than there is in the, in, in the, in the, in the natural. And so we have to understand we've gone from physical, uh, taking, using uh, the country for example, America, the people that came here were in physical bondage. Then they sought their freedom. Then uh, the country uh, chose to put slavery in pay place, and now you have physical bondage. That physical bondage uh, came all the way up through the civil rights movement. Now it has become spiritual, because what has happened is that the mind is a tricky thing, and we need to understand that according to the spirit, that's how we are supposed to live, because Paul said, it is no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. Far too many Christians are still living in their soul as opposed to be living in their spirit. And understanding that we, uh, as human beings, 
our only hope is in uh, God himself, through Je in, in, in Jesus Christ. So we have to live according to the mandate, the order that we have been given, and do what thus saith the Lord. So where we are right now is that racism is being spread across this country, not because there is racism, but because there are some people here that want to still divide this country. You have the opportunity to make sure that that doesn't happen. You have the opportunity to live out a great life. I hear too many people complaining about America when we're the greatest country there is. We have our faults, but we have a kind of freedom that uh, no other country has. Uh, my brother, who's deceased, my middle brother, was in the Navy. And he, he traveled overseas, and he talked about the lifestyle of some people overseas, where you see a man with his hand cut off, his foot cut off, and it was a rule of law as opposed to a rule of man. So we have to live under the free system that we have in America according to what God has gifted us with. So I would say to you that make sure that you understand that your rights end where mine begin, my rights end where yours begin, and we respect each other as human beings. And we be that, continue to be that light that shines on that hill. I am still working toward bringing unity within this country to let people know that there's only one race, and that's a human race. Man has made uh, it to be where we're separated according to race because we all came from one man, that man was Adam. Now if you're a Christian, you understand that you have moved from Adam to Jesus Christ. And so now we worship God because God is a spirit and we must worship in the spirit and truth, not according to our flesh, nor according to our soul. So we have to know that we are the people that God has called out to continue to move toward what we are supposed to be a righteous people. Awesome, awesome. I think one thing uh, too that's uh, important for us, especially during our time in our culture, is that we're becoming so increasingly uh, individualistic and we are becoming less and less involved in community and family. Um, it, now everything is just the individual and then from the individual to these big national issues. And, there, and there's like nothing in between. Where it used to be that you, know, you had community issues and local issues, I mean some of us if I were to ask, I'm not going to call anybody out, but do you actually know the name of like your local mayor or your local state representative? Um, I, I just moved. I don't know my mayor yet, but that's okay. I got a pass because I just moved. I do my last one, so it counts. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the local issues and the state representative, that's, that's actually where a lot of the business gets done. Uh, that's where infanticide is getting signed into law, is that some of these middle layers of society. And so, one issue I'm seeing, and I think is important for us to, to keep in mind, is that we are. Um, we are not just an individual and then big issue. We have to constantly fight those forces that, that make us want to stay in our own bubbles. And we have to reach out and be a part of the community. Um, and so a lot of like community activities are on the decline now. Uh, a lot of even just recreational sports and things with uh, with people uh, in your local areas uh, is actually in the decline in our country uh, since since before, since years earlier. Uh, and so I think that's really unfortunate uh, because people are lonely, people don't have the answers, and people are, are not looking to anybody on their left or right for help. As I, as I was saying some of the statistics earlier is that only 30% actually trust their fellow Americans. Uh, and so that's something that I think is, is, is really problematic. Uh, and then also, and with our churches, that's why the, the church is so important too, is, is keeping um, that, that spiritual level and, and having some level of accountability. Uh, because we like our individual bubbles, no one can tell us what's right or wrong, you know, it's all like the, the my truth thing. No one can tell us, you know, no one keep us accountable, know us, we have no authority above us, uh, and we're more comfortable that way for some reason. And so we have to really fight against that, uh, be willing to submit to, to leadership, be willing to be rebuked. I mean, it's like, God forbid your pastor tell you, 
you're wrong on something, right? Uh, so th that, that ability to submit and that humility, I think, is going to be key. Because uh, literally right now in the United States, and this is going to sound crazy, but this is literally what there's articles running right now saying that people are, while, while church attendance is on the decrease, people are much more spiritual now. So we have so not so fewer churches, but much more spiritual. Uh, and literally witchcraft and all these kind of spiritual stuff is now on the, is on, is on the rise in our country. And I think that's evidence of this, of this kind of individualistic, you know, no one can tell me what to do uh, kind of attitude. That's something that's kind of a force we have to fight against in our country too. I agree. You're here with us today because you're leaders and pioneers, but you didn't get there without struggles. And I'm sure that there were times when you found yourself wondering if it was worth it. How did you get through those times when, when things were really uh, at a low point for you, when you were facing adversity at the point where you thought you would give up? How did you get through those times? Um, I was, uh, had the opportunity, as I said before, to be raised in a wonderful family. I can hear, as I said before, my father praying right now. And he's my hero because I saw the things that he went through. I had to recognize that he went through tougher things than I did. My two older brothers, the same thing. And so I call upon the times when I was not supposed to be here. And God still has me here. I came out of a very rough neighborhood. Had to fight almost practically every day have had a gun put to my head on two different occasions. And God brought me through all these things because he had something here for me to do and he still has something here for me to do. Because I have miles to go and promises to keep according to God. So when in my downtime, I have learned that God had his hands on me when I didn't know who he was. And so now I always go to him and I know that when I'm on God's side, I'm in the majority. So I'm not concerned about what I see going on in America today. There's one thing that we don't do enough of, and I'll mention my father again, what held our family together was his praying. We do not pray enough. We've got to do that because God knew you from before all the way up to now, before you were even a glint in your father's eye. And so he has a plan for this uh, world and we need to become a part of that, fl that plan. And so no matter what, my spirit rises up in me and says, go to God in all things. The last, when I lay my head on the pillow at night, I pray, the first thing in the morning I pray, so prayer is the answer. We have to believe in him more than we do ourselves. Awesome. This is another one of those questions I don't want to go after, Mr. Henderson, is like your personal struggles, like civil rights movement, the 21st century, my iPhone broke. Like, I don't, I don't know <laughs> what my personal struggles are in comparison to that. Um, but I, um, I think one thing that perhaps might relate to some people in this room is, I, so I grew up in the church. My, my parents are pastors. Uh, and. I, um, I've always been blessed enough to, to have a relationship with the Lord, even since I was young. Um, and one thing that I, I've noticed that kind of uh, can be a struggle for a lot of Christians uh, is that we know that we're, we're called to do something great. We know that God has, has a specific calling on our lives for something. Uh, many, perhaps some of you in this room know you're called to do something, uh, something perhaps something big for our, for our nation. Um, and sometimes it, it can be uh, almost stressful because you feel like you're in this race against time, and it's like, oh, I haven't really done anything. I feel like I haven't really accomplished what God has called me to do. Like, oh no, like, am I running out of time? Like, what, am I, you know, what am I supposed to be doing? And it's like this kind of stressful feeling that happens in a lot of Christians. Uh, and so, uh, and it can be a, a really deep struggle for you and it can almost like your, it's almost like your calling is haunting you. Uh, and I think that one thing that's very important is to remember that we, have, we serve a God of peace. Uh, like, that Jesus Christ already saved the world. We, we don't have to save the world. <laughs> like, it, it, so that's one thing 
thing that I that I hope that you guys remember, that like some some of those personal struggles, uh, is that we we don't have to be in this race against time. It, when we, are the most important thing we will do is love God, love our family, love our community. Everything else is just icing as uh, icing on the cake. Uh, that's that's the love. That's what we're going to be judged for is the is our love for other people. Our love is comes as much. The Bible says it's much more important than all the gifts is, is our is our level of love. So that's something I think is important to remember uh, as we get wrapped up in all these and our calling and everything else. One more question for you. Um, the Heart of Liberty University is grounded in the gospel message, and we're about training champions for Christ. Um, speak to your personal relationship with Jesus Christ and how that shaped your calling. All leaders all over the world should come out of the church. I have been a member of two churches in my lifetime. The first one was more social than anything else. But when I found out who God was, I continued to run to Him because I know that His favor surrounds me as with a shield. That I'm an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. And my testimony is that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know that no matter what happens, God is in control. And whether I live to be a hundred or whatever year, time frame I live, I know it's but a short time as opposed to eternity. And so God is entirely in my life. I live for Him because He gave me life. Every step I take, every breath, every, every step I make, every breath I take is, uh, is according to God. Well, I know we're running out of time here, but I, I'll just say that uh, having a personal relationship with Jesus is the most satisfying, fulfilling thing that, is, that, ever, that you can ever do in your life. So if, if you don't know him, I'm telling you, it, it is it, the life with Christ is so much more fulfilling than anything this world has to offer. Uh, and, and, and that ultimately is what brings me joy at the end of the day. So, Thank you very much for your time. We're here. We really appreciate your insights. And let's give them a round of applause. At this time, I'd like to ask our Executive Vice President for Spiritual Development Campus, Pastor David Nasser, to come out and say a few words with yeah, us. Yeah, I know, we, I know we just put our hands together. Can we thank this distinguished just panel as well? Phenomenal job. Thank you so much. Um, I think this dovetails right into what else God has in store for us in this particular week. Uh, we constantly get asked, you know, what are our, uh, our specific plans and our strategy every year as we come into February for Black History Month. And we always say we, uh, first of all, are intentional in, in presenting a diverse group of thought and leadership throughout the entire year. We, we want to see a, a glimpse of heaven, not just in February, but every month and everything that we do. Uh, however, during Black History Month, we join our nation. We actually join several nations in the world, several who do Black History Month in October, and then we join our friends in Canada who do it in the month of February in spotlighting uh, the influence of influential African Americans that uh, in this country have really made a big difference, but for so many years have been neglected in, in being honored properly. And so the days like this certainly help move the bar forward a little bit, but uh, Wednesday, we have Pastor H.P. Charles with us. He's going to spend the whole day with us. He's going to do the morning convocation, and then he's also going to do campus community for us. Um, he's a great leader in this nation, and was the head of the pastor's conference for the Southern Baptist Convention last year. Uh, I just spent uh, some time with him in New York earlier this week, and he was talking about uh, some of the, some, in some of our internal meetings, uh, some of the ways that we can practically not just celebrate the idea of diversity and equality, but just get very practical and actually say, how does this apply tomorrow in my life? And he's going to come and bring some of that conversation to our convocation stage. We also have Calvin Noel. Uh, Calvin is a, a, a great 
great African-American leader in, in the realm of worship. Uh, he's on tour with Michael W. Smith, but he's going to get off the tour for one day and lead us on Wednesday as well. And then on Friday, we have Nick Wojciech with us. Uh, Nick uh, is uh, one of the most inspirational, compelling guests alive today. And he travels the world and uh, talks about how he has no arms, no legs, but no regrets, no limitations. And he really talks about privilege from a, a very different perspective. You know, you can all day long uh, have a dialogue and even a debate on whether there is white privilege or black privilege, but you have to admit, right, even at first glance, that certainly someone with no legs, no arms, is at a less privileged place than someone who does have legs and arms. And so you can't guess on that one. You can't go, well, what is your, you know, uh, what is your upbringing or what did, what did your mom and dad give you? You look at that man and say, every day he wakes up at a physical deficit that's, uh, you know, uh, where we are afforded things that he's not. And he comes from a place where his victory in Christ, his identity in Christ, his security in his faith uh, in Jesus helps him not only see the those as obstacles, but opportunities. And you're not going to want to miss what he has to say. It's going to be an incredible week for us. But uh, let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll, we'll close out this particular Convo Select. I thought it was an important conversation and one that uh, really had a lot of handles and action points for me. I know we've already thanked them twice, but one more time. Can we just honor them? Phenomenal. Thank you. So grateful for the Helm School of Government. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. We thank you for uh, this opportunity you give us to gather together and to learn from one another. And God, I know that... Um, Racism breaks your heart, and so it breaks our heart. I know that, God, we're capable of more, not just um, here at Liberty, but just in this world. God, uh, we've come so far, but we've got so far to go, and we can't do, God, what, what only you can do. And so we, we bring our lives before you. We, we submit ourselves to you and ask that, God, we would... Um, we would strive to see heaven on earth, God, that, that, God that, that every nation, every tongue, every tribe will be equal at the foot of Jesus, and that, God, um, that that would be our drive, that not, not just as a, um, a people who want to see all of these people redeemed into heaven, but in the here and now, Father, living um, in a greater place. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. You're dismissed. Thank you.